On April 1st, we began our journey. That is at the border of Arizona and Mexico. And I promise you, we did not plant that flag there. We just rolled up and we're like, oh, that's kind of photogenic. We'll take a picture next to the flag. Um, so we started our journey and we had a few hiccups. Kind of day two, I was in charge of the maps. And I, I, w- I, didn't, I didn't get lost. Like, I always knew <laughs> where I was. But the landscape wasn't exactly what I had intended it to be like. So we were planning on like a 22-mile day, and it ended up being 40. And we finally got into camp at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Everybody was grumpy. That's understandable. And this is some of the terrain that we were going through. Just absolutely beautiful. And we were coming down a hill. This is on like day number four. This is the director. This is Phil Baraboo. This guy is an amazing cameraman. If you ever need to do a film project, he is your dude. But Phil is not a horseman. In fact... He'd only ridden a horse like once prior to the journey. He's pretty handy now. But on day number four, he was tired, which is understandable. He just did like a 40-mile forced march. Um, And he's going down the hill, and the horse is in front of him, and he's not paying attention. He just walks into this horse. And the horse just reaches back and just tags him right in the thigh, like I mean, if you took a sack of potatoes and just dropped it, well, it actually didn't sound like that at all. Um, But it sounded bad, and we thought that his leg was broken because of the sounds that he made. Uh, I wish I had that audio. Um, But uh, we went up there, and, you know, he took his pants off. He had this massive bruise that was in the perfect shape of a horseshoe. I mean, it was, it was really not. I think it was a size one shoe, um, which was cool because for the rest of the journey, we watched this big blood bubble go all the way down his leg and out his toe. It was, it was really cool. We, we should have done a time lapse on it. That'd be amazing. Um, but yeah, and then my father-in-law, who's a doctor, he gave us all these drugs before we left. Like, all right, if you get in a bind, you know, use this for this and this for that. And we're in a hurry and we're in a bind. So I'm just like, Phil, eat this. Like, eat that. And I think we ended up accidentally giving him some muscle relaxers. And we put him back on the horse and he's like, mm. And for the next three hours... Man, we, we limped out of there, and he rode, but he was in bad shape. He had to go to the hospital, but he was fine. Uh, but it was, it was tough, because then whenever the cameramen weren't there, we had to be the cameramen. And um, sometimes our stuff wasn't as in focus as theirs. This guy, I love this man so much. His name is Val Geisler. And he stopped everything that he was doing in life. He was 74 and said, I'm going to take two months and go help you boys. And he was our road crew to Arizona. And old-time horse trainer has adopted dozens of Mustangs and uh, helped us start the journey and imparted all of this, this cowboy wisdom that um, he's just a dying breed, an amazing human being. Then Thamer got dysentery after he got kicked in the head by the horse. But he got over that too. <laughs> um, moving on, we got to the Grand Canyon. We went down the South Rim, crossed over the bridge down at the bottom. The horses were like, I don't know about this. Because <laughs> you had to go through a cave and then onto a bridge and then along this little tiny goat path. But they did fantastic. These horses, after about the first couple of weeks, they, they, they figured out what was going on. And they were excellent, excellent ponies. Um, and maybe that's 
possibly the reason why Thamer thought it was a good idea to get a donkey. But I think another thing is, you know, people think of the wild horse issue as like a wild horse issue, but, you know, the burrows are really important. And he wanted to burrow. Yay! I'm so happy. Finally get a little fun. When I dropped off the three horses a couple weeks ago, Thamer asked me about the burrows and uh, if I had a burrow to bring him and I might just happen to have one. Oh, that's perfect. Well, she's a lot better than yeah. Take that bug, Brandon. Man. What? Donkey whisperer. <laughs> the donkey I definitely <laughs> adds a little flavor to our outfit. A little salt of the border flavor. That's pretty good, Ben. She has, she has no idea what she just got herself into, though. <laughs> Now, I like donkeys, but I think it's going to be a complete disaster. I just don't think a donkey can do 20 miles a day over rough terrain, keeping up with full-size horses. It's just not big enough. I give the donkey a couple weeks. Maybe you'll just follow along peacefully. Or maybe we'll be minus a donkey. Come on, donkey. And then Donkey proceeded to follow us all the way to Canada. Yeah. I wish I, I, wish I brought her. I love that donkey. Um, it's kind of funny. Like, I, uh, I keep, she stays at Tom Glover's house in Texas where I have my horses right now. And we have these seven Mustangs and this donkey. And everywhere the donkey goes, there's like seven big Mustangs that follow her around in single file line. She's like the queen leader. She was nice to have around. You know, horses, they kind of do their own little horse thing. But donkeys, they really like people. And there was a lot of times where we would just be hanging out. And donkey would just come in and like give us her. She loved to get her ears scratched. And her ass, she, you'd just be hitting there, and you're like, all of a sudden, there's a donkey butt in your face. <laughs> but there were some, some downfalls of having donkey. She um, would eat all of our stuff. Like, if you, could, if you kept a granola bar or something in your pocket, she would, like, go and find it, and she would eat it. And we kept losing our spoons. We, we met this, this people this this family and they're 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 professional spoon makers they make wooden spoons and they gave us some of these wooden spoons and you know whenever you're in the back country and something goes missing and there's like four people and you're certain that it wasn't you you're like somebody has my stuff they're like it's not my fault somebody else did it like who has taken my spoon and one day and there's like animosity in the group. And we're like wondering where the spoons are at. And we're like eating with our hands and stuff. <laughs> and we got down to the one spoon. And I looked over at Donkey one day. And she has this spoon in her mouth just going. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like Bugs Bunny. As the spoon's just getting smaller and smaller. And like splinters flying everywhere. And it's really incredible. She ate our spoon. <laughs> but we forgave her. I love that Donkey. But we... uh we, we tried not to take ourselves too seriously. 
big, big fan of Harry Potter, but unlike most people, I wouldn't really consider myself a Gryffindor. I consider myself more of a Slytherin because I think if I had, you know, special powers, I would probably speak Parcel Tongue. Anyways, we figured that it'd be a good opportunity to scare masters. Hey, masters! Masters! <laughs> That's so messed up. Oh, man. I'm going to get him back one day. Um... But yeah, it was it was an incredible. It was just an amazing thing to do, and I'm not not throwing snakes on each other, but like the journey as a whole. Um, and it was it was neat because whenever you do a big expedition like that, it becomes kind of a lifestyle. Like whenever you go on a backpacking trip or a weekend vacation or something, which you know I'm all for it. I love doing that. But it's different because you're like leaving this lifestyle and doing a vacation and if it's for like a week or two weeks or three days or whatever, then you come back. But whenever you're out there for five months, it stops becoming a vacation and it becomes this lifestyle. And it was really neat to kind of compare that lifestyle to what it was beforehand and, and then what it is now. And some of the things that I really really enjoyed about that trip, you know, beyond the scenery and, and beyond all that was the camaraderie, you know, whenever you're, you don't have the ability to look at your email or your Instagram or your cell phone or anything, and you're forced to sit and talk with other people for hours. That's something that I don't really have happen a lot you know, since this trip. And I really enjoyed that sense of friendship and of closeness and of disconnection. Um, I also really enjoyed just like the very physical nature of the decisions. You know, it wasn't, um, you know, am I going to do this digital project or that digital project or try to push this product or whatever. It was, am I going to go split wood or am I going to clean dishes? Are we going to go left or are we going to go right? It was a very physical, existential kind of lifestyle that, that I really enjoyed. And it's an experience that I'm really glad that I have. So I always encourage people to ride horses from Mexico to Canada. And, I mean, just some of the country that we saw. Uh, this photo here was taken by Corey Richards, who's an Nat Geo photographer. Absolutely awesome guy, amazing photographer. Um, and just kind of a, a piece of, of, of public land. This is the Wasatch Plateau. This isn't a wilderness. It's not a national monument. It's not a national park. It's not like this iconic place that people think of going to, but it's incredible. I mean, it's stunning. It's aspen trees for as far as you can look, vistas that are, you know, world class and it's 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 ours it's public land and we have an amazing amount of it we're so fortunate to have it i don't know if i'm ever going to look cooler in my life than i do right there <laughs> so um, it takes a nat geo photographer to make me look cool um and this was in yellowstone and that's gray horse and frisky at simi and that is stumbles and that's dinosaur off to the right. Kind of looks like a dinosaur. And this was in Glacier National Park. Um, definitely one of the finest views of the entire journey. And um, this was crossing the Gallatin River in Montana. It's kind of a hairy spot, but by that point in time, our ponies were rock stars. And one more in Glacier. But it was, it was impossible to not um, be just completely overwhelmed by the landscapes that we went to and, and went through. And I don't know, here's, here's just, a, just a piece of some of the stuff that we saw.
American West is pretty amazing. Well, that wasn't very profound. I tried to think of something really profound to say right there. But I let the video speak for itself. Um, but man, I, what a journey. I, I really kind of want to do it again. And then on September 6th of 2013, we got to the Canadian border and we completed our trip at Glacier National Park. And to kind of give you guys a sense of what it takes to create a massive production like this, you know, we had our producer, a production assistant, uh, assistant editor, Paul Quigley, uh, some of the students from Montana State University, Phil in the hat, um, and then Corey were the two cinematographers. So, you know, it takes a big team to, to put a production like this together. And the two cinematographers are kind of the, the humble ones in the trip. You know, they did the entire journey and they filmed it all. And, you know, they weren't in it, but um, it wouldn't have happened without them. But just, just amazing, amazing guys. And they were, you know, as much of, of the team as anybody else. Um, there's a surprise in the movie. You're going to have to watch the movie to find out about the ending. But um, we, we finished the trip. And it was, it was, it was weird because, like, it was, it was time to end. But at the same time, you know, we kind of wanted it to, to continue. But, you know, it was becoming fall. It was about to get winter. It was, it was time to finish. But um, the horses, they, they just did such a good job. And... Whenever we finished, I decided to try to think of a way to kind of give back to the horses because, you know, they took us all the way from Mexico to Canada and didn't really know how. And then I learned about this event that they do in Fort Worth uh, with the Mustang Heritage Foundation where they have these training competitions with the purpose of getting these wild horses adopted and finding homes for them. So I gave away I gave away my Mustang, Luke. He's he was my fishing horse. Like you don't just give away your fishing horse. Um, somebody asked me the other day what my favorite fly fishing fly was. I told him a horse fly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, we we gave we gave Luke away and. With that money, what they do is they uh, they pay horse trainers to train these horses to make them more adaptable to other people, and then they launched a veterans program with it. Uh, and then a few months after I auctioned him off, the guy who bought him, a guy named Tom O'Brien out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, he called me out of the blue and said, you know, Ben, I, uh, I bought that horse because... I wanted to make a donation to the Mustang Heritage Foundation, and we're not riding him, and I'd like for you to have him back. Uh, will you take this horse back? Because, you know, I'd done a lot with him, and he was, didn't really want to give him up. 
And I was kind of having regrets about giving him away. So whenever he offered that, I was like, you know, are you, are you sure, number one? Because that's huge. It's like one of the kindest things anybody has ever done for me. And whenever he said yes, I was like, yeah, of course, I want my horse back. Uh, he's an awesome horse. He's my fishing buddy. Uh, and I'm pretty certain, I don't know this, but I have put it on the spot. But I'm, I think that my wife said yes because of my horse. <laughs> and I, I really don't blame her. Um, so we got married not too long after I'm branded. She put up with that. And I was like, I'm going to put a ringer on her. And this, this is our family. So, uh, pretty proud of my family. We got Tough, Luke, Violet, or Violet, and Dinosaur. Uh, they're my boys. I taught Luke how to read. That's the book that I wrote. It's horse grade reading level. He really likes the pictures. Um, and then one of the biggest honors that I had, well, I guess with Unbranded, uh, it did really well. The movie turned out a lot better than we had expected it to, which is a testament to the filmmaking team. And we ended up taking it to different film festivals, and it got picked up, it got put on Netflix, so a lot of people got to see it. And we were able to do a theatrical run um, probably showed in like 500 theaters in the U.S. Like it did, it did really well. Uh, it, it got a lot of eyeballs on the film and, and to know that these horses were there for adoption. We got a lot of horses adopted, uh, which I'm very proud of. And one of the biggest honors is after the release of Unbranded, I was nominated to sit on a volunteer panel uh, the Wild Horse and Burrow Advisory Board, which is a group of volunteers that meet to advise the BLM on how to um, manage their wild horse populations. And the role that, that I was nominated to sit on was wildlife management, um, which is a dream come true because as a wildlife biologist, you know, I was now uh, able to represent the interests of wildlife on 31.2 million acres of public lands in the American West, uh, which is really nice, but it's also a difficult subject because there's a lot of horses. Um, it's a political topic that involves horses and wildlife and ecology and the ranching industry and public-private land mixture. Um, but this is kind of where the wild horses exist in the West. It's a, these are actually herd areas. They're actually a little bit smaller, the herd management areas where they actually exist. But you can see uh, mainly in 10 Western states. And they're still rounding up horses. And they're still putting them in pens. And um, it's just a completely broken system that uh, everybody will agree with you that the wild horse and burrow situation is a complete wreck. You know, there's three times the amount of horses on the range that is the target population, which is a controversy all to itself. And then, you know, almost 50,000 of them uh, sitting in feedlots and sitting uh, on leased pasture. It's insanely expensive, and it's just ignited this huge controversy in the West. And as we were touring Unbranded, uh, we showed it at Telluride Mountain Film, and I met this amazing woman named T.J. Holmes who decided to do something about it in the area that she could. And when she told me about it, I was like, I want to make a movie on this. Dang it, that was the cue for the movie. I missed it. All right, but before I do show that, before I show that film, <laughs> sorry, before I show that film, I do want to talk about one thing, which is we have over a million livestock on public lands in the American West. We have 75,000 wild horses and burros. And bison, the undeniably native large herbivore, is virtually non-existent 
on our public lands with the exception of Yellowstone National Park and like two or three other places. And I've always thought like, that is crazy. You know, we've exterminated the bison, their populations are now a lot higher than they were 120 years ago. But I think it would be pretty cool to see some bison reintroductions into our public lands. Uh Uh-huh. We'll see what happens. But this is a picture of me. And all of that grass that you see is all cheatgrass. It's an invasive annual. And it is a non-native. And it has taken over somewhere around 50 million acres of the American West. To put that into perspective, that's about 20 Yellowstone National Parks. It's a massive, massive issue, and it can be caused by overgrazing of cattle, of horses, of wildlife, and it just kind of shows the importance of management on, you know, in this area, there's like federal, there's state, there's private, and it kind of shows the importance of different agencies working together to try to prevent um, massive invasive species monocultures from popping up because it threatens biodiversity, it threatens teeny species. Um, it's just not a good situation. And now, here's the film that I was talking about five minutes ago. I'm TJ, and I document the Mustangs of Spring Creek Basin. I've been doing that for about nine years now. I volunteer for BLM. I dart with the PZP fertility control vaccine to try to slow the population growth in Spring Creek Basin, but not stop it, so we can at least lengthen the interval between roundups. And it's an amazing thing that that little thing right there is gonna prevent her from having a foal for a year, which will potentially prevent a horse from growing up, being rounded up, going to a holding pen, There's that psh of the rifle, and then that mare jumps. It's like a school of fish. The whole band is tuned into each other. So when she darts, they all go. But like you could see with these guys, they didn't go very far. Spring Creek Basin is almost 22,000 acres, but it wouldn't matter if we were 220,000 acres. We call the theory behind it is still the same. You know, you've got to have the resource to enable the horses and the other wildlife to live here. And if you don't have that, you don't have a healthy wild horse herd, you don't have a healthy elk herd, you don't have a healthy deer herd or pronghorn herd. It's the same type of conservation philosophy. For us to make the PZP program work here, we couldn't do it without volunteers like TJ. It's a smaller herd area. Um, We have a smaller number of horses. What works here for us does not necessarily work exactly the same from herd area to herd area. Can it be used everywhere? Maybe not. Keyword, maybe. I don't know. Does BLM know? My goal, really, is to manage on the range, manage them where they're found in the wild. So in an ideal situation, um, I'd like to see BLM adopt more partnership models, use volunteers to help document, help dart with PZP, to lower the birth rate of the horses on their ranges to the point where we can equal the horses coming off the range with, with the adoption demand. I'm making sure that every mare has the chance to contribute her genetics. Here we are, 2016, we haven't had a Roundup, won't need one for at least another couple of years because of the success of PZP in Spring Creek Basin. That has been the, that has been my life, in a nutshell. Um, But it's a pretty good thing because you can look back on these last nine years and say, you know what, I made a difference. This is the hurt in my heart. And that's why I do what I do.
It's pretty cool what she's doing. And what she says at the end, I think, you know, just really strikes home. It's like if we can get, if we can use fertility control to slow the population growth to where the amount that do need to be removed equals the adoption demand, then we can stop putting them in feedlots, which everybody wants. Um, in my opinion, and some people don't like me because of this, I don't believe that we're going to get to that situation without some type of lethal culling. Um, I hopefully I'm proven wrong, but it's a serious topic. Um, you know, you'll definitely see it in the next in the next uh, few years popping up because it's it's only a growing issue.